good afternoon, and thank you for joining the National Conference of State Legislatures webinar, What's Coming Down the Pipe, The Fundamentals of Securing America's Natural Gas Pipelines. Today's webinar is hosted by NCSL's Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee and is part of the committee's 2015 Spring Webinar Series. If you'd like to see a complete schedule or to register for any of our other webinars, you can visit our website at ncsl.org. My name is Christy Hartman, and I'm a Senior Energy Policy Specialist at NCSL. I'll be moderating today's webinar, which will address the fundamentals of pipeline safety, including the roles that state and federal officials play to ensure the safety of the nation's pipeline infrastructure, and ways in which natural gas utilities are addressing safety concerns while also meeting growing demand. Before we begin, I wanted to mention that the webinar is being recorded, and everyone will be able to access a recording of the webinar and presentation slides on NCSL's website. We will send out a notice shortly with a link to these resources. Our speakers today are Jeff Weiss, Associate Administrator for Pipeline Safety at the U.S. Department of Transportation's Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, and Kyle Rogers, who is the Vice President of Government Relations at the American Gas Association. Um, our presenters will take questions at the end of today's webinar, and you can type your questions in the question box that's located on the right-hand side of your screen. <coughs> we are fortunate to have Jeff Weiss as our first presenter. As I mentioned, he serves as the Associate Administrator for Pipeline Safety at FEMSA, and in this capacity, he leads FEMSA's enforcement of regulations covering the design, construction, operation, and maintenance and spill response planning for the nation's pipeline transportation system. Previously, he served as FEMSA's Director of Program Development for Pipeline Safety, where he led several programs to enhance FEMSA's pipeline safety damage prevention and community involvement initiatives, public awareness, field implementation of the integrity management program rules, research and development, and the national pipeline mapping system. I'd like to welcome Jeff, and I'll turn the webinar over to him. Thank you so much. Um, that's quite a mouthful, isn't it? You know, I'll have to shorten that bio next time. And by the way, it must be uh, humorous to note that I think at this point in time, Kyle must be clean shaven and I have his goatee. So, uh, well, listen, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy to have an opportunity to speak with you today. I'll try to make my comments relatively brief. Um, happy to spend time really listening to what you have to say, hearing from you, and um, being able to have a discussion. So I'll try to be brief and um, that's not my forte. I did want to thank the NCSL though. Um, obviously uh, state legislators are key stakeholders in pipeline safety. Um, ironically, although I know they're pressed on a million fronts, uh, many of them probably don't know that they're a strong player in the pipeline safety equation. So give me an opportunity to talk about that a little bit, and uh, I welcome it. So I'm honored to be here, especially with Kyle. I've known Kyle for many years, have high regard for him, and we're on regular contact on a variety of issues, not the least of which is one where I give clear credence to him on reauthorization of our legislation, and Kyle will be talking about that more. So I'll start by uh, saying, first of all, happy Memorial Day to everyone. We've got a nice long weekend coming up. I hope you all get out to enjoy that, spend some time with your family and your friends. Next slide, please. This is what I thought I'd talk about a little bit. I'm going to do a quick introduction because you, you may not know us, some of you, and it'll give you a chance to know who we are. A little bit about when I say we, who we mean the states and the federal government together, as I'll explain. Talk a little bit about performance, because I think it's important for you to understand the metrics behind our agency. But there's a boatload of those, and I thought I wasn't sure of all of your interests, so I put a lot of them in an appendix, um, and you can look at those in, at your leisure if you wish. I have a little bit of contextual comments, talk about what's happening, reauthorization, and I do have an ask that states could consider. So with that, we'll go to the next slide. I work in the U.S. Department of Transportation. Our Secretary of Transportation is Anthony Fox, uh, appointed by the President uh, going on two years ago. Our current uh, Deputy Administrator is Tim Butters. Cynthia Quarterman was the Administrator till last October and uh, she resigned at that time. Tim has been running the show since then. 
Vanessa Sutherland is my chief counsel and deputy administrator, but she has been nominated by the president to be the chair of the Chemical Safety Board, and I expect her probably over the next month or so to be transitioning out. My name is Jeff Weiss. I have two deputies, Linda Doherty and Alan Mayberry, and I wanted to make sure you had heard the name Zach Barrett because Zach is our state programs director. Next slide, please. A little bit about we, and this is uh, just by way of explanation. In, in my world, the Congress sets the laws and they, they designed the National Pipeline Safety Program. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but prior to 1970 or thereabouts, uh, the states generally regulated pipelines um, in every state. Um, as, as happens often, there were a number of significant events and it at one point, the Congress stepped in and decided there would be a national program. They assigned responsibility and accountability and charged the Secretary of Transportation with building that program and also enabled the Secretary to partner with all the states um, to carry it out, particularly for what amounts to intrastate um, pipelines, energy pipelines. It's roughly a $50 million annual grant program, and all the states besides Alaska and Hawaii participate. Um, Happy to talk to anybody from Alaska and Hawaii if they're out there. We've tried numerous times. Uh, state jurisdiction really varies according to whatever kind of agreement that they, the state sets up with us. By and large, all states pick up the utilities, the local distribution companies and municipal, municipal gas, but uh, some will or some won't pick up gas transmission or liquid transmission, uh, LNG if it's intrastate. And, and, Numerous states have applied to us and been given status as an interstate agent, so they basically act on our behalf on interstate pipelines. I, that's probably a very short version. I put a link in here should you ever want to try this out. We built a lot on a, a, a website uh, called Stakeholder Communications, and it's got most of what you'd want to know about your state in there, and I'll, I'll give you some more links a little bit later. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, the Congress reauthorizes this pipeline and safety program every four years. Um, Kyle and I will both be talking about that a little bit more in just a minute. Next slide. Just a little bit by way of infrastructure size. Seems weird that we would have calendar year 2013 data, but some of the data doesn't even come in until June, so I'll update it as soon as it does. But gives you a good idea. If you look at the mileage, these are all energy pipelines. There's roughly 2.6 million miles of it out there. Um, you know, dominantly gas distribution, mains and services to homes and businesses. That's 2.1 million. 80% of the system is distribution. Uh, there are somewhere in the order of 3,000 operators, a lot of plants and tanks out there. So it's fairly far-flung, complex enterprise, and I just give these numbers by way of illustrating that. Next, please. I, I throw this slide in for a couple of reasons. Uh, people hear about pipelines all the time, but they tend to hear about what I would define as high consequence, low probability events. The day-to-day -day events that uh, used to shape our metrics, as you'll be able to see by the bottom half of this slide, have been in a general downward decline now for a long time. Um, and we continue to work with our state partners and with the industry itself to drive that down to zero. That's our you know, agreed upon goal. This has all been happening in a time, the upper half of this graph, what you can see is that the infrastructure, the mileage of that pipeline system has grown. The amount of gas that's consumed has really grown. Um, U.S. population is just a proxy for people living near the pipeline, um, has grown rapidly, some growth in the petroleum product consumption, but I throw those in there just so you understand that the, the overall potential risk has grown during the same time that the performance trends have been heading downward. Next slide, please. I'm just going to highlight a few of these and uh, apologies to Christy and everyone because you did say that if it was graphics intensive it might take longer to load and the next few slides are. Uh, 
this is one of the things that, we, of course, we're all concerned with. You know, pipeline incidents and engage, involve death or major injury. Um, as you can see from this sliding uh, curve and the, the kind of best fit, we have that trend line declining about 10% every three years. Um, and I think that's an important testament to the work that we've done together. We've been partners now, many of us, for since 1970 uh, and some of you in 1980. So uh, we've done good work together um, and we've driven this down. We're not going to rest until we drive it to zero, but I did want you to feel comfortable that the general trend line is good. Next, please. Uh, you, this is one I'll, I'll, I'll certainly stop for a second to comment on. Major hazardous liquid pipeline spills have also been declining about 10% every three years, but many of you will have heard by now about a pipeline spill that occurred out near Santa Barbara, California. I have about five people on scene right now and a lot of people engaged in our headquarters and other offices. They, these things keep us pretty busy and they are tragic and they, there's no need for these to happen. When an operator fails, um, we're going to go in, we're going to take control of the scene and the situation, we're going to make sure it's safe, we're going to begin a causal investigation and we're going to look for the potential, if it's there, of non-compliances that could have led to that or otherwise. So did want to say uh, the, this is an operator performance slide. It talks about how they've done with spilling and liquid pipelines. Good progress being made, but clearly it only takes one or two to catch uh, the fancy of the nation. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Next, please. Uh, this is probably more than what you want. Um, I did want you to know that these are the reporting criteria. So eventually if you get to the slides in the back or the ones I've just gone through and you want to know what is he talking about when he says serious or significant, these are the definitions. Next, please. So again, a little bit more on um, the industry performance record. Um, here we have uh, serious accidents, and those, as I just mentioned, involve uh, fatality or injuries. Um, the trend is good, and it shows us this is all system types, but it also gives you a sense that really 90% of the serious incidents that occur in the national energy pipeline system occur in gas distribution. You might you know, say what's going on there, but as you'll recall, I just got through mentioning that it's roughly 80% of the infrastructure, and I would point out that it's the infrastructure that's most densely surrounded by people, so the probability of things happening, I think, it's not, this is not done to point fingers anywhere, it is just to say where's the opportunity to make improvements in reducing serious incidents. It's really in gas distribution, which is dominantly um, controlled by the states. Next. And here a little bit on um, gas distribution, a little bit more. I didn't go into the other types of sectors, but they're in the back. I did want you to see, however, that um, other outside force damage is a huge component of this. A lot of these tend to be things like vehicular impacts, um, and I'm sure that Kyle could tell you that we see these things almost on a daily basis. Some of this will be, um, you know, other things like frost heave or what have you. But the one that I'm going to call to your attention, and I'll talk more about in a second, is the excavation damage one. Because this is really just a frequency analysis. The consequence analysis, when you look at that, you find that excavation damage really does tend to lead to more harm to people than just about any other cause. Next, please. The significant incidents, again, the definition here, these are just what the federal code requires to be uh, reported, and it can be you know, $50,000 worth of property damage, um, for example. The, the distribution amongst the sectors is a lot different here, but I, I think you'll understand, and the Santa Barbara case will drive home that point, that it doesn't take much oil and water to become a very expensive event. Um, so there are reasons why this distribution between the sectors is different and significant. 
Um, but again, this tends to be anything that's federally required to be reported. Next. Here, when you get into significant incidents, and again, we're talking things that pick up property damage and uh, lower events that could be precursors you know, to a bigger event, take a look at what happens with excavation damage. Now, all of a sudden, you know, really a third of this is being led by that way. Other outside forces drop significantly. And all other causes, um, this is a pie chart for calendar year 2014, and the other tends to be really high in the first year that it was reported. It takes a while for these to be fully investigated. That, that percentage should drop. Next, please. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm largely done with the data drill, so hopefully uh, you were you stuck with us for that. I did want to comment a little bit about what's what's going on in our world before I tell you what's coming down the pipe. I, I probably don't have to point out to many of you that the energy picture in the U.S. and, and the policies that deal with it uh, are quickly evolving. They're driven by a lot of things, but of course it's the the discovery that the U.S. now has enough natural gas to potentially be an exporter in the next few years and a, the country being you know, energy independent um, within another 10 or 15 years for sure. It's just staggering for those of us who've been in the business for very long to see that change, but it's bringing about a lot of things and that pipelines connect all these distributed supply centers to the consumption centers or refining centers where it then moves on for consumption. Um, and as a result, um, this sort of pull back and forth between various parties, the people who are more into clean fuels, uh, non-hydrocarbon variety, and then the traditional uses, it's been pretty intense. You see pipelines and hear about them all the time. Probably heard about one like Keystone XL. It's a good example of that. Recently, however, I think because a lot of these pipelines aren't getting built, uh, a lot of that crude oil that moves around the country has been shifting to rail, and you've been hearing a fair amount about that as well. Media is accordingly becoming very interested in FEMSA and in the state governments and how well they take care of their infrastructure and oversee the operator's performance. But as I said earlier, I and I hope that I was able to show you with some of that data. Our agenda is really being set by these serious accidents. A friend of mine who runs a national advocacy group told me once, and he was absolutely right, is that you know frequency is interesting, but consequence is what matters. Um, and so the consequence is what gets people's attention. I'd point out that reauthorization of our program that I mentioned earlier has begun, and people, Kyle and I, talk frequently about this. What's going on? Um, what What are people's positions on this? There are a lot of calls, and you're going to hear this for our agency to do more. Um, and typically, what that means is that uh, one party or another wants a prescriptive requirement added to our code, and they try to get it added through legislation. I'm not sure how that's going to come out, and Kyle's in a better um, position to judge, so I'll defer to him on that. There are a lot of administration calls for additional resources for OPS, and this is one of the cases where I had modified this slide earlier and say, and the states. I'll get back to that, but the uh, administration fought for and got an additional $10 million this year for states' participation. Next slide, please. So finally, you know, back to what you asked me to talk about, what's coming down the pipeline? I'm sitting back and reflecting on this and things that are kind of shaping our environment and driving us to behave one way or another. One of the things that we're going to see uh, very soon, um, but I've been spending a lot of time with these people, is the Department of Transportation and all departments have their own inspector general. They issue a variety of reports, and they're about ready to issue their top 10 management challenges. And one of those, they're going to consider our oversight of state pipeline safety programs. Um, the NTSB recently uh, released uh, a, not so much an audit. That's a misnomer. It was really a research study on integrity management. And amongst the many recommendations they made coming out of that were that we needed to do more to help the states carry out the um, inspections that are needed to be done. I will point out for those of you not that 
familiar with it. We train all the federal and state inspectors. So all state and federal inspectors have a base nine weeks worth of training before they're really certified to do a lot of um, inspections by themselves. So um, that said, seven, as I tried to point out to you earlier, roughly 75% or so of all the human consequences that occur, um, you know, and measured in fatalities or injuries occur at a state level, typically in the distribution system, which is overseen um, by the states. States can, as I should have pointed out earlier, they can add uh, increased requirements <clears throat> pardon me, to, the, um, to our requirements, but they cannot sink below it. We establish a level playing field. The states are clear lead on issue of damage prevention. I'm going to come back to that in a second, so I'll punt for now. But there is a drive for more prescriptive rulemaking. I, I understand that, that drive, and um, I can comment on it, but I, I believe that there is probably more value in a blended approach, and we can talk about that in Q&A if you want. Something that's come on the scene in the past three to four years really uh, came out strong and getting stronger is the whole focus on methane emission reduction. I'm sure most of you have heard about this, so I won't dwell on it. But uh, folks are looking at all sources of emissions. And uh, while I think you can show, even by uh, stats produced by EPA or Environmental Defense Fund or others, that the energy pipeline side is not really the largest source of these emissions, I think it's all sources are going to be in the focus, and our focus going forward is going to keep the product in the pipe, um, and I think that you'll hear that more from us. <clears throat> There's been a lot of focus on uh, infrastructure modernization after a few major accidents that have occurred. <clears throat> I'm sure most of you have heard about San Bruno, California. Um, many of you would have heard about Marshall, Michigan. Others might have heard about Allentown, Pennsylvania. These are just a few. Philadelphia. Um, in almost all cases, we had <clears throat> excuse me, um, aging infrastructure involved there. It, age itself is not a determination of the quality or integrity of a pipe, but it's you know it's an indicator that you want to at least look at. I provided a link here to high-risk pipe replacement initiative that we had underway, but we partnered with a lot of people. And I want to give credit to AGA because they've been very instrumental in working with legislators such as yourself and with commissions um, in advancing what we'll call innovative rate recovery structures in the states that have tried to accelerate the, a lot of this infrastructure modernization. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as a result of a lot of things that went on, including the reauthorization four years ago, we uh, pretty much, in fact, um, thinking real quickly, pretty much every one of these um, is an outcome of that series of accidents that I just cited and our last reauthorization. They all occurred right before the Congress was considering what to do with the pipeline safety program. Between the Congress and the National Transportation Safety Board, the IG, and the Government Accountability Office, we ended up with 80-plus mandates and recommendations. And those things uh, are very much factor into reauthorizations. We can talk about that more later. The ones here I think <clears throat> you'd be interested in, and, and just it's coincidental that today we're, we're printing out in the Federal Register of our plastic pipe rule. I think that's something... AGA has been advancing for a long time as well, so Kyle can certainly comment if he wants. Uh, our gas transmission um, and gathering line rule is finally at the Office of Management and Budget. I'm, <clears throat> I'm eternally optimistic that it will come out sometime soon. And the everything else on here is either at the Office of Management and Budget, uh, maybe the next to the last one could be still in discussion with our secretary's office. The last rule is still in my hands, um, but I'm having a very difficult time uh, getting a cost benefit to justify these mandates. So I continue to work that one, but I think we're close. Next slide, please. 
Uh, before Administrator Quarterman moved on, um, and she established with, with us and our participation these priorities. I won't dwell on them a lot, but I did want you to see that given everything that had gone on in our environment, Cynthia recommended to me that we make a high priority um, of improving state program oversight. It's all part of how we anticipate and avert high consequence events as well as implement all of these Congressional Act mandates and recommendations. You will have heard a lot of backscatter in, in the media and elsewhere that I think in large part is driven by the fact that it's been very difficult over the past, uh, gosh, I don't know, uh, five, six years to move rulemaking. Uh, it's just everything is bogged down. So. It is uh, Congress is getting upset that their, their mandates aren't getting done. Their mandates are included in the rules I just listed, but I can't move rules. So it's not a particularly uh, fun place to be. A lot of what we do, though, is engaging, educating, empowering people who have a role in pipeline safety, most of whom really don't understand it. I will talk a bit more about damage prevention in a second. It's one of my passions. I'm actually a board member of the Common Ground Alliance and uh, believe that that's a real important initiative. Uh, other thing I wanted to focus on, if you, you'll be hearing more over the coming days about pipeline safety management systems and safety culture and the role that they can both play in driving that record of industry uh, performance down to zero accidents. So I just wanted to mention it here so you hadn't, if anybody has questions, they'll be glad to swing at it. We also have roles out beyond inspection and enforcement and writing rules. We have a really good research and development and technology advancement program. Uh, we've begun partnering with colleges and universities and we're about ready. Um, within the next few weeks we'll be announcing a whole new suite of awards to some of these colleges and universities with some really smart kids who are trying to bring in and bring some of that savvy with them and give us some outside left, left field thinking. Um, that's probably all I'm going to cover here for right now. So next slide please. So reauthorization, again I'm going to touch on this but uh, I'll defer to Kyle because uh, he, he certainly works the hill more than I do by for sure and he knows this stuff infinitely better so I just make it fool myself. So I will tell you the discussions have started and the administration has not taken a formal position. Um, and while you'll hear a lot about this, we've actually completed about half of the mandates and recommendations that the Congress, those 80 plus that I told you about, about half of those are done and almost everything else is caught up in things that are beyond my agency. Um, so I, I would just say people are working hard and I think you'll see a lot of these mandates and recommendations get addressed over the next year or two but uh, and we'll keep working that. There's been a lot of talk about a straight reauthorization and Kyle can expound on this but um, I do think that given that most of these rules have not even hit the streets yet let alone taken effect it seems like it would be a little imprudent to start saying what else is needed. There are a lot of issues in play here, but again, I'll defer to Kyle on that. Next slide. This is one of my last slides, I, um, and I, I don't want to eat into Kyle's time here. I think I've chewed up mine by now. Um, I did have an ask for the states, and it, if I may be so bold, um, I'd like to ask you to, if you don't know more about, if you don't know much about pipelines, we've created this website, I told you, Stakeholder Communication. The link is here to the main page. There's a ton of things, everything from the basics. What kind of pipelines are out there? What do they do? What are they made of? You know, who's involved in that? Who regulates? So um, I would commend that first one to you. Uh, if you want to know more about the risks in your state, um, you can check that second bullet and it talks about pipeline replacement. We have stats state by state um, on what kind of higher risk pipe are, you have in your state um, and you'll be able to see that pretty quickly. Um, of course, the experts in your state are your state's pipeline safety program. The first hyperlink underneath the third bullet will allow you to very quickly figure out who they are, what's their authority, and how do you contact them. And if you want to know more detail about pipeline safety performance in your program, that second 
hyperlink under the third bullet will give you a lot in there, including enforcement, including uh, accident history. So there's a ton of information here. The last ask I had for you is that this is where we really need the state legislators is making positive improvement in state damage prevention programs. I mentioned earlier that states have the lead here and by design. Um, there have been talk about a federal, federal legislation, but uh, I work with HEA and others on a daily basis and have done so now for 16 plus years. And I can tell you that the consensus amongst people is states should maintain the lead in that. So for a really good big picture background on damage prevention, check out that first link there. Um, if you want to know more about what's going on in your state um, and what do your state laws cover and what don't they, or what opportunities for improvement you might have, that last hyperlink will take you there. Um, Surely most states, just like the federal government, have room to improve, but there's something on the order of about 10 states that um, really have no enforcement to speak of whatsoever. Um, we are statutorily bound in the, to do a rulemaking I highlighted earlier. It's currently with the Office of Management Budget in final form, and I expect it to be coming out. And what it says is that states that are determined by our agency to have an ineffective uh, damage prevention enforcement program um, will be uh, kind of penalized on federal grants um, that come from our agency. Uh, and in that case that they we do have to make that determination, which is the last thing in the world that I want to do, I tell you that now, I'll do anything to work with you to prevent that too, and that's why I'm raising the issue for you is that we would take over enforcement. And I'm not resourced for it, to be honest with you. Um, and if we have to, what we'll end up doing by design, we'll have to come in on a bad accident that's damage prevention related. We'll take over and we'll be really loud and we'll have to say we're only here because the state didn't do it and the state's supposed to be doing it. So I, I want to just stress now that that is not our goal. It never has been. We've developed this program over many years. Your state pipeline people will tell you that. We provided grants to the states to try to help them improve. But the last element, as defined by the Congress and others, of an effective damage prevention program is enforcement, and we're finally at the point where it's time for people to get serious about that. Next slide. I think that's it for me. So, uh, Christy, I'll take it however you want, and I can, you can just mute me if you'd like to have Kyle go on and do Q and A at the end, or it's up to you. Thanks, Jeff. And we actually did have just a couple really quick questions come in, so maybe we can take those now, and then Kyle can speak uh, right after that. Great. Um, the the first was when you had the miles of pipeline slide up. Uh, there was a question that just asked, is there a way to track that by state? So does FEMSA have that, inf that data available, or is there a website that people could go to to see the miles of pipeline by state? Yeah, absolutely, and thanks for asking. Um, that If you look at the one of those hyperlinks, and I think Christy is posting this uh, pretty soon, one of the first hyperlinks that I provided um, allows you to get in and just see your state and it has in there all that fundamental information, you know, how many miles. In fact, in part of that website, you can find by county, you know, how many miles of what kind of infrastructure are there. So good question. And I, um, I you know, if anyone, I'll, I'll provide you uh, my contact information and people can feel free to contact me if they have questions afterwards. That's great. And we had... Um... I think you've, you've touched on this quite a few times in your slides, but we had a few questions coming in asking, um, can you give any specific examples of sort of the oversight or what role uh, states play related to pipeline safety? And when you had your uh, priorities for FEMSA up for 2015, were there any specific examples um, for the to improve state program oversight? Okay, sure. Uh, again, back on that website that I, the hyperlinks, I think you'll find when you when you do take a look at those, they'll they'll answer that for you. They'll tell you exactly what the jurisdiction is in your state. Um, they'll tell you who the people are who carry out that jurisdiction and how to reach them, you know, as well as how much they have. 
but but at a very macro level, what I'll tell you is the states are largely in charge of gas distribution and gas transmission that is in associated with that, and that's a crude, you know, macro analysis. Some states have taken on um, hazardous liquid transmission pipeline as well. Um, and I will, I should add quickly that some states have gone beyond the federal code um, and have picked up gathering lines, where so-called gathering lines, which pick up more towards the wellhead or the lease and gather that, and take it into a processing or transmission line, processing center or transmission line. So there's a there are quite a few varieties of forms that the states take, but that by and large they almost all take gas distribution and most take intrastate gas transmission. Um, as to the priorities, yeah, they, I think that this, the, uh, the overall analysis on that is that the states, we've been encouraging states to staff up for a long time, um, and states have been hindered in that, not, I think, because they don't want to, but because there are statewide bans sometimes, or, um, even though we're paying 80% of the cost of bringing on those additional people, there are concerns the money won't be there as much as I try to tell people it is a permanent um, grant from you know the Congress. And so unless the Congress does something strange, which they haven't done in my whole tenure, and take it away, um, it will be there. So a lot of it is about that and getting qualified people on the job, getting them fully trained, making sure that they're being rigorous enough um, you know in their inspections but we tend to when we, we evaluate all states every year for program performance and every three years for financial performance uh, we tend to grade on a curve and we're pretty kind and I think that's my words other people have said that we need to be harder on evaluating performance um, and the NTSB said the states really weren't as well prepared as our people. So I've got a lot going on in the training arena to try to make it easier for state people to get the qualifications they need. So those are a couple of examples. Well, thanks again, Jeff. And uh, just a reminder to anyone listening that you can type in your questions on the right-hand chat box um, on your screen. And uh, with that, we will uh, introduce Kyle Rogers, who serves as Vice President of Government Relations for the American Gas Association. In this capacity, Kyle is responsible for managing AGA's government relations goals and programs with a growing focus on state-level advocacy, including governors, state legislatures, and public utility commissioners. Uh, Kyle also represents the association before Congress, administration, administrative agencies of the federal government, and key policymakers. In this role, he advises the association and its membership on the impact of proposed legislation, determines its appropriate response, and designs the advocacy strategy to achieve the industry's legislative policy goals. So with that, we'd like to welcome Kyle, and uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Jeff, for all the kind words. Jeff does a phenomenal job, and uh, as you no doubt heard uh, in his comments, he is a wealth of knowledge. Uh, I'll try to be quick, understanding that we're uh, getting closer to the end time here, but uh, I did want to touch on a variety of key issues. So if we just proceed to the next slide, please. Just by way of background, the American Gas Association, founded in 1918, represents more than 200 local distribution companies. We deliver natural gas collectively to over 177 million Americans nationwide. Uh, natural gas local distribution companies deliver natural gas to homes and businesses across the country. Uh, those uh, businesses will be commercial as well as small industrial in size. Natural gas is used by consumers in a variety of applications, as you all know. Uh, that may be heating, cooking, manufacturing, uh, increasingly generating electricity, and also fueling transportation. Uh, with respect to state legislators, the one thing I did want to note is increasingly what we're seeing as a trend around the country is a focus on expansion of natural gas service. So that means more pipes in the ground. Uh, this is due to the uh, abundance of supply, uh, the positive attributes attributable to natural gas, be it lower energy bills when you uh, convert from something 
to natural gas, uh, increased efficiencies on the direct use applications at the end use, as well as lower emissions. Uh, in all of that, the priority of AJA's members is to ensure the safe and reliable delivery of that natural gas to those homes and businesses at an affordable and stable price. Next slide, pr please. And we'll just uh, continue on. You can pop through uh, to the slide that says commitment to safety. Uh, AJA's board, board of directors has designated pipeline safety as its number one priority and natural gas utilities continue to be vigilant and committed to systematically upgrading infrastructure based on risk-based integrity management programs, that very thing that Jeff spoke about. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, uh, there have been incidents in the past. The one that drove much of the policy that was contained in the uh, last reauthorization that Jeff mentioned was the uh, horrific San Bruno natural gas incident in San Bruno, California. On the back side of that, uh, the Secretary of Transportation at that time, Secretary LaHood, issued a call to action uh, both to uh, the utilities and, and their, you know, my board and CEOs, as well as to the regulators in the state and the commissioners. Uh, we heeded that call to action, and in 2011, uh, our board at the AGA approved a commitment to enhancing safety. Uh, we've had a longstanding record of providing natural gas service safely and effectively. Uh, but as you see there on the graphic, uh, we wanted to ensure that we were doing everything we could with respect to regulation, compliance, and enforcement, uh, sharing best practices across the industry, uh, developing standards, and also uh, with data collection and analysis to ensure that we have the safest system going forward. Next slide, please. As Jeff mentioned, uh, there's uh, roughly 2.4 million uh, miles of pipe in the ground and natural gas pipelines are an essential part of the nation's infrastructure and natural gas utilities spend roughly $19 billion or more annually to help enhance the safety of the natural gas distribution and transmission system. Next slide, please. With respect to regulatory oversight, uh, as you heard from Jeff, the DOT's FEMSA establishes the federal safety standards for pipelines and sends up partners with the state pipeline safety agencies on inspections and enforcement of intrastate pipelines. However, individual states can regulate intrastate pipeline systems above and beyond federal requirements, and there are hundreds of state-specific pipeline safety regulations currently in place. Uh, with respect to our commitment to safety, you'll see there on the right that uh, AJ supports the improvements in the safe delivery of natural gas through continued information sharing, R&D and safety enhancing technologies and deployment of that technology, collaboration with key stakeholders. Uh, and in that, I would include policymakers at all levels, be it local, uh, state legislators, governors, uh, commissioners, certainly in, in Congress. Uh, with respect to the call before you dig and excavation damage, advocating for the effective enforcement of call 811 or call before you dig. Uh, several states have passed individual resolutions uh, calling a specific day, uh, call before you dig day, and also conducting forums or uh, facilitating uh, stakeholder meetings or sharing information and best practices such as uh, is hopefully occurring here on this call. Next slide, please. Jeff mentioned that uh, the DOT had issued a safety action plan to raise the bar on pipeline safety and to accelerate the rehabilitation, repair, and replacement of pipelines no longer fit for service. Part of, uh, or a key aspect of the um, most recent pipeline safety reauthorization vehicle, which was signed into law back in 20, January of 2012, was you see in Section 7, a focus on um, uh, auditing, if you will, the cast iron in the system. and. Uh, I have some slides later that we'll get to that, but there was a real focus on cast iron and bare steel pipelines, pipelines uh, of a certain vintage that were decreed as uh, possibly being no longer fit for service. So AJ stepped forward to support the action plan and the smart modernization of infrastructure that's no longer fit for service. Uh, and with that, we, next slide please. Uh, as, as Jeff had noted, um, we're regulated, natural gas distribution companies are regulated at the state level by the Public Utility Commission. 
And so in collaboration with their national association, which is NARU, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, um, we work to have a resolution adopted by them at their 2013 summer meeting. And you'll see here uh, that NARU has encouraged its members to consider adopting alternative rate mechanisms, which Jeff uh, referenced, that uh, facilitate the accelerated uh, replacement of pipelines no longer fit for service. I do want to note with respect to this resolution that um, in the first resolved, you'll see that it says encourages regulators and industry to consider sensible programs aimed at replacing the most vulnerable pipelines as quickly as possible, along with the adoption of rate recovery mechanisms that reflect the financial realities of the particular utility in question. The reason for that sort of language is because each utility is going to uh, have to assess uh, its system individually. There's no panacea or one size fits all. They'll work collaboratively with uh, their pipeline safety regulators in the state and their commissions to identify uh, a rate structure and a, um, a program that will best fit their needs and be tolerable both from uh, uh, the insurance to safety as well as the economic impact on the consumer or constituent. And then also you'll see in the second resolve clause that it says consider adopting alternative rate recovery mechanisms as necessary to accelerate the modernization, replacement, and expansion. There again, just wanted to highlight that there's an increased focus on expansion of service into uh, areas that are unserved and underserved within uh, states or service territories. So uh, that's where we coined the phrase smart modernization. So as you are replacing a pipe, Increasingly, commissions and state policymakers are also looking at how to, um, at the same time, if, say you're increasing uh, pressure or you have a new material going from cast iron to plastic that can hold an increased pressure, possibly thinking about getting to the next neighborhood over or something uh, thereabouts. Next slide, please. With respect to infrastructure investments, as I noted earlier, uh, there's a, a total spend of, of more than $19 billion annually to help enhance the safety of the transmission and distribution systems. But I wanted to highlight on this slide the fact that, uh, again, utilities are working with governors, legislators, and state regulators around the country, and utilities are developing uh, these innovative models for making these capital investments possible. And I wanted to focus specifically on, on those on the next slide. Next slide, please. So what are utilities doing with respect to accelerating the replacement of pipeline no longer fit for service? Um, there's a growing effort underway to accelerate uh, a replacement. AJ and its members are committed to that effort. Uh, and again, that work's being facilitated by regulatory and legislative policies that establish uh, rate mechanisms that will allow for accelerated replacement and recovery of um, the expenses for doing that replacement. Um, you'll see here that the overall trend is positive. Uh, nine states moved to adopt programs in 2013 alone. Uh, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and D.C. adopted pipeline safety measures or replacement measures rather in 2014. Just this uh, year, West Virginia passed uh, a law which gave the authority to the Public Utility Commission in the state to um, implement one of these innovative rate mechanisms and and those can vary they do vary not only uh, state by state but those different uh, companies operating within the borders of a state may have uh, a different program but they can be such things as a tracker or a surcharge or what we call a rate stabilization mechanism or a rider on a bill uh, and here we have a map for those of you who are interested the AGA keeps a compendium which lists every single uh, program like this in the country. Today, 39 states and the District of Columbia uh, have some specific form of rate design that facilitates accelerated replacement, uh, under which about 90 plus companies today are um, accelerating replacement of pipes. Next, uh, next slide, please. So getting back to that provision that was in the last pipeline safety reauthorization bill focused on cast iron, 
You'll see here today that overall cast iron makes up less than 3% of the distribution mileage in the ground, and it's decreasing annually. Um, next slide, please. And uh, wanted to provide you uh, with specific information, and of course, is much like Jeff, if you uh, desire specific information for your state, please just contact me and I'll do uh, everything I can to get you those specifics. Um, we audited by way of a survey of our membership um, to determine the replacement um, frequency and mileage of our membership. And based on those responses, which came from approximately 108 members, comp member companies of AGA, uh, mostly the, the bigger companies, uh, LDCs plan to replace between, let's say, 3,500 and 4,000 miles per year of aging mains and services through 2017 and beyond. Uh, you note here that these are projections and are dependent on such factors as weather and workforce availability, et cetera. But um, I think on scale, this gives you a, a very good idea of how utilities are moving forward to uh, get cast iron out of the ground. Uh, and of course, these numbers are going to continue to increase as uh, uh, new filings are approved or new programs are implemented. Um, I should note that I, I said that 90 uh, companies operate uh, within these structures today. I know that there are four companies that presently have filed rate cases with their public utility commission specific to replacement. I would anticipate uh, all of them in some form or fashion to be approved at, at some point within this year or next. Um, sometimes those, uh, those filings take a while to come to conclusion, but I think with the growing focus of Jeff and his great team at PHMSA espousing the need to accelerate replacement of pipes no longer fit for service, uh, our, uh, our board here at AGA and our commitment, our, our utility, our member utilities commitment to uh, doing likewise, and then of course NARU with their resolution and their leadership uh, pushing for uh, commissions to uh, roll up their sleeves and work collaboratively with the utilities. I think increasingly you're going to see that uh, the numbers reflected on this survey are going to continue to increase. And the upside of that, uh, or, a, or should I say a significant co-benefit, next slide please, in fact I think you can go two forward, is this uh, as Jeff mentioned, with the growing focus on emissions, as pipes no longer fit for service or replace, you see a um, corresponding decrease in emissions, uh, certainly as you're putting in new pipe. If you have pipe that uh, may have leaks or what have you, you're going to capture those with a replacement. Next slide, please. And as of uh, uh, today, uh, you, I'm going to go through this one as well. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, as little as 0.1% uh, uh, of uh, natural gas is emitted from uh, LDC pipes. And you'll see here that um, over the course of the last uh, 30 years, over 65,000 miles of cast iron and bare, bare steel have been replaced with um, plastic pipe. We've added 300,000 miles of distribution mains serving uh, 18 million new customers or a 32 percent increase of customers and that's uh, going back to that expansion effort um, and those numbers will increase obviously as uh, today 35 states in some form or fashion are looking at uh, various uh, uh, policies relative to expansion uh, but you see that there's a corresponding 16 percent decrease in uh, emissions since 1990 and today uh, EPA estimates that uh, on the distribution system, 0.26% uh, uh, is, is coming off of uh, distribution pipelines. And again, as uh, those uh, programs for replacement uh, continue to be implemented, that number will only continue to go down. Um, so it's a great co-benefit of the uh, replacement activity that's going on across the country. Again, uh, for those uh, of you that are legislators, here at the AGA, we keep a compendium of all the replacement activity, both approved, ongoing, and filings that are before public utility commissions around the country. 
uh, specific to mileage, what have you. Uh, happy to share that with anyone who might want that as well. We have a compendium on expansion um, so that if you were to uh, want that information as well, we can uh, give that. Next slide, please. And I'll just uh, conclude with, again, stressing the fact that uh, we take safety very seriously here. It is priority number one. Uh, we want to ensure the safe and reliable delivery uh, to our consumers. And uh, I will also just touch once again on this idea of smart modernization as uh, you as, as legislators are looking not only at the replacement activity in your state, but also the growing hue and cry by your constituents looking to uh, perhaps get natural gas service. There is a, um, uh, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, initiatives ongoing relative to how you couple the replacement with expansion to uh, increase safety and also drive down emissions and uh, increase economic activity in your state. So with that, I'll wrap. Hopefully I uh, have some time for questions if there are some or open up a conversation with Jeff on reauthorization. Thanks, Kyle. And uh, we don't have any other questions in right now, but uh, we can give uh, folks one more minute or so if, if they think of anything, but in the meantime, would uh, you or Jeff like to offer any final thoughts before we close up here? Well, if there, if there are no questions, since Jeff threw me uh, the ball, I guess I'll take a swing at it relative to reauthorization. Um, uh, we don't yet know what the schedule holds for, for reauthorization. So uh, for everybody's uh, edification, there are three committees of jurisdiction in Congress, you have the House Energy and Commerce Committee, the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and the Senate uh, Commerce Committee, all of whom have uh, a role to play in reauthorizing the Pipeline Safety Act. Um, we went into uh, this year thinking that perhaps, as Jeff alluded to, a straight reauthorization or something as close to a straight reauthorization as uh, might be possible would be the preferred way to go. Uh, I, at the in the AJ, continues to believe that would be uh, the best strategy. Uh, I think other stakeholders, uh, by and large, do as well. Um, but certainly, as Jeff mentioned, with the uh, liquid line incident that has just recently occurred, um, and the fact that there is some, uh, uh, how would I characterize it, uh, Jeff, you know, there's some folks on uh, Capitol Hill that are upset that they've not yet seeing conclusion to things that they legislated um, uh, in the last reauthorization, all attributable to what Jeff said. I mean, it's just the process and it takes a while. Uh, I don't know that a straight reauthorization is a possibility. Um, however, um, I, I believe that we'll probably see our first oversight hearing sometime in July, uh, perhaps in the Senate. And then um, we'll just have to proceed from there. I don't think anyone can really forecast exactly how things will shake out uh, on this particular reauthorization. Well, for my part, I know that we've only got a couple of minutes left. If you allow me, I'll just make some closing comments. First of all, uh, you know, I always enjoy listening to Kyle, and and uh, it, you know, I think our messages. I hope you'll you'll see our messages is very complimentary. Um, you know, I think we've both been through this enough to see the same thing and what needs to happen. But <clears throat> my closing comments, I first of all, besides thanking everyone for sticking around for the, the end of it uh, and taking time out of your day, I did want to say something. I, I, it dawned on me one day when I was talking with my kids about, um, I talked to them about energy. And I said, uh, you know, where do you, where do you use energy? And if you stop to think about that and you talk to people that you know who may not be familiar with this, most people really don't know. They, they're not connected to the benefits that they derive. Um, but I, I think you all know that in every moment of our day depends on energy that's delivered to us in one form or another. We all share that safe, clean, reliable energy service requirement. But pipelines are critical infrastructure designed, um, I'm sorry, de uh, designated that way by Department of Homeland Security and others because people realize they're crucial to the way we live. Creature comfort, our mobility, our economic growth, 
uh, countless products that are made from those things that are transported there from plastics to fertilizer but in the end a lot of this is hazardous materials it has to be done the right way that requires that we work together um, states have a clear role here um, and I, I welcome partnerships with people if you have a need for help and damage prevention or anything don't hesitate to ask we, we love it we'll work Watch the Belmont and watch uh, American Pharaoh for Victor Espinosa is one of he, he wears the call 811 on his boots and he's done that for the last two uh, triple uh, stakes here. So anyway, thank you for your time and I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Kyle, for taking thank the you. time to uh, speak on this webinar today and also. I wanted to remind um, all the attendees that uh, we recorded this webinar today and that we'll make the presentation slides available. Uh, so you should receive an email shortly about how to access these resources and you can also register for our upcoming webinars, um, including tomorrow's webinar on state's role in updating pool safety codes. So thanks again and uh, we hope to have you on another webinar soon. Thank you very much.